them much more important than the other. But the first question, give me a little more volume, I think. Thank you. No. He's, he's multitasking back there. So, um, the first question was not as important as the second question, but Jesus, who was a master teacher, was leading them to the next question. And we know what those two questions are. The backdrop to the questions we talked about last week, but just as a reminder, we remember the crowds, the multitude that gathered around Jesus. They've, they've followed him. They find out where he is and they flood the town where he is. He crosses by boat to, to get away from the crowds, to have a break, and they hear about it. They go running to the other side of the lake uh, to meet him at the other side. When, when he lands, there were crowds wherever Jesus went. And why wouldn't there be? There would still be crowds today if Jesus were in the flesh and walking the earth today. Among these crowds, there were those with great and genuine needs, just as there are today. And Jesus always has time and attention for those with genuine needs. He always has time. He always has time. The hard part is finding out the heart. Is this a real heart for Jesus? Is this a heart that's reaching him? So there were those in the crowd. And Jesus always had time for that. Jesus always had time for those in the crowd that were outcast. They were not accepted by society for whatever reason. Perhaps like Mary Magdalene, a sinful past. Perhaps like Matthew, who was called to be one of his disciples. Um, they had the, the type of job they had chosen or the friends they had, because his friends would have been the Romans, who were the leaders, would have made the other Jews hate him. And probably because he was corrupt and dishonest. Many tax collectors were. But Jesus had time for people like that as he did for Zacchaeus when the rest of society didn't in all of the, in all of the crowds. Jesus had time for that. And then in the crowds there were those that wanted to be entertained. They wanted to see something, something exciting. They wanted something new, something different. They wanted to see somebody who was lame suddenly walk. They wanted to see eyes that had been blinded, opened. Wow. They wanted free miracle food. Who wouldn't want free miracle food? Wouldn't you want free miracle food? <coughs> Stephen says, mm hmm. <laughs> there is the natural, there is the natural desire for this, the exciting thing, to see something new, to see something whatever. That is why so many people will go to the latest thing. That's why so many people will go to, oh, this is happening. This big name is in town. That big name is in town. And God still works miracles today. God still does things today. God meets needs today. But there will be in that crowd many that just want something new, that want to receive a blessing, if you will. That's why the, the, I know people that will go from meeting to meeting to meeting. I, I don't know if it's as common in Hong Kong. It's very common in the U.S. and perhaps in other countries as well. They'll go from meeting to meeting to meeting. Oh, to hear this and to hear that and to see this and to see that. But they have no desire to have a change of life and become followers of the Lord Jesus Christ to become his disciples because that costs something. That requires something of the listener. That requires giving up some things, letting go some things, being disciplined in some areas. And many people just aren't interested in that. But they are interested, interested in exciting things. It was true in the time of Jesus and it is true today as well, because people are the same, aren't they? People are the same. And there is that in you and in me that's, that likes the exciting thing. Honestly, 
if I heard somebody is going who is blind is going to receive their sight in Kowloon Park this afternoon, I would want to go and I would want to see it. There is that part of it. There, there's that part that there's a natural appeal, but there must be more than that. Jesus was not interested then, and he's not interested now in entertaining people. And many people today only want to be entertained, pr primarily. That's their, that's their primary. They may be happy with some other things, but it grieves me when I see so much, and maybe I'm wrong, but it seems to me that there is so much of the Christian world today, it's entertain me. There's a spotlight on what's on the stage, and it, is entert it, it doesn't go beyond entertainment. Now, the Lord can take the curious person and lead him on for something more. But God knows that heart. God knows that heart. And so Jesus, all these crowds that, were, that wanted to see an entertainment, that wanted another free meal, that were wondering, is he going to be Messiah now? Because, as I said last week, if Jesus sets up his kingdom and he becomes Messiah, then, hey, here is a Messiah that can do exactly what I want him to do. He can perform miracles and he can give me free food. That's what I want. That's what I want. And so they were following him for that. And Jesus had no interest in feeding that in people, in, in entertaining people. And so that's the backdrop for what we've been talking about. What does he do? He leaves those crowds. He leaves those crowds. He leaves the opposition that is rising against him. And there will always be opposition against Jesus Christ. Did you know that? Jesus is the most divisive figure in history. Understand what I'm saying. He, he, he divides. He divides. Have you ever found, if you're talking with someone, you can talk about God, you know, but if you start talking about Jesus, oh, some people don't want to hear that, do they? That's that's a little t that's a little too intense. That's a little too. Uh, uh, let's keep it at arm's length. Let's talk about God, Jesus. Wherever Jesus was, opposition would rise because Jesus never maintains status quo. Jesus comes to make a difference. He comes to make a difference. And whenever, wherever Jesus is, there will be those that say, yes, I want what you have, what you offer, Jesus. And there will be those who say, let things stay the way they are. Let things stay the way they are. And opposition increased. So Jesus takes his disciples out of that, goes up north to Caesarea Philippi, this place. And we talked about it last time. By the way, if you were in the first service... Last week, you will have heard some of this before. I've, I've had to switch a little bit because sometimes I have a different emphasis in different services, so I'm going to pick up some things from last week's first service and come again into second service. So the two services today are quite different, actually. Um, so he takes them away. He takes them up north to Caesarea Philippi. And um, I want to talk about that just a little bit. And it's, it's here that he asks the two questions. Okay, slide one. He came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, and he asks his disciples, here are the two questions. Who do people say that the Son of Man is? And he asks that question because he wants to lead them to their response, to their response. Listen, the world says all things about Jesus, and he will never try to win a popularity contest. What Jesus cares about is this. What do you say about Jesus? How do you look at Jesus? How do you respond to him? Not just here, but here. Who do you say that I am? And what you say and how you see Jesus makes all the difference in your life and my life. It does. It makes all the difference. And he says to his disciples, but who do you say that I am? Who do you say that I am? We talked about this last week. Jesus makes it personal. Good doctrine is good, but good doctrine is not enough. Good doctrine is not enough. Did you know that the person with the best doctrine in the world is the devil? Did you know that? In this world, the devil has better doctrine than any of us. He knows the Bible inside, outside, upside down. He knows it all. But he's the devil. I know Christians who have all, oh, all sorts of good doctrine, but their hearts and lives have been transformed very little by the power of Jesus. 
by the power of Jesus. Jesus cares how you respond to him personally. Who do you say? Who do you say that I am? We used the example last week of Martha when Jesus, after Lazarus has died, remember what does Jesus say to, Mar to Martha? Let's just uh, pull up that slide just a second. Uh, the, the, is that the next one? Yeah, that's the next one. We didn't look at this last week because I had added it to my notes late, but this is part of the passage. And this is the passage where Jesus speaks to Martha. If you look at this part, she has all of the right doctrine, just as we do, right? All of the right doctrine. Yes, Lord, they, he will rise. My brother Lazarus will rise on the last day. Um, and which is, tr is that right doctrine? It's right doctrine. The Bible teaches that. But Jesus wants to make it personal. He wants to deal with her heart, not her head. Now, Jesus will deal with our heads as well. But he's coming to the, he comes to the part of us, the will, the choice, the response. And he says, everyone who, he says, I am the res resurrection and the life. Do you know what? I was thinking about this last night. I know these words are a little bit smaller, but you can look at it later. It's John 11. 21 through 44 is the whole passage. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me will live. And I was thinking about those words, and then I was thinking of what Paul says. Do you remember what Paul says? Um, he says, I want to know Christ. I want to know Christ. Do you think Paul was talking about, I want to have good doctrine? Do you think that's what he was saying? Absolutely not. Paul was talking about in experience, in my experience, in how I live. I want to know Christ because that is what makes the difference, brothers and sisters, in our lives. In our lives, knowing Christ, apprehending, experiencing. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death and so somehow to attain to the resurrection of the dead. That's the whole passage. And I love that because when Paul talks about knowing Christ, it's every part of Christ. It's every part of the experience, the Christian experience. So many Christians, sincere Christians, so many people, we just want the good parts, don't we? We want the goody. I want the, sun, I want the sunny days. And when the cloudy days come, and when the rains come, and when the storm comes, no, 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 I don't want that. No, God, you're, you're God. This is, this is actually central to what we're talking about this morning. No, no, Lord, you're, you're Lord God of everything. You control everything. And they reject these things. Brothers and sisters, he is still the same God. And Paul says, I want to know him in all of these areas of life. And Jesus says to Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. And then he wants to get it from here mm, to here. And he says, do you believe this, Martha? Do you believe this, Martha? He makes it personal, as he always does, as he always does. You can see the crowds again. All the crowds are gathered. Look at verse 37. Someone, but some said, this man healed a blind man. Couldn't he have kept Lazarus from dying? Do you know? The people around you that don't know Jesus, they'll look at your life, they'll look at your situation, they will ask all sorts of questions that are hard to answer. Have you found that to be true? All sorts of questions. And they will be very, very difficult to answer. You better keep your eyes on Jesus. You better keep your eyes on Jesus and hold on to Him. Hold on to Him. And you'll notice when we look at this, this is how we know that Martha's doctrine was good but it wasn't really in her heart and it wasn't really in her life, was it? Because when we get to verse 39 and Jesus says, didn't I, t right before that he says, didn't I tell you? He says, he says, move the stone away, move the stone away. Martha, who is so practical, so practical. She's, I think Martha's sort of a Peter personality. Um, I think the two would have gotten along <laughs> together or they would have clashed a lot. Peter, t we, we see what, what her belief really is because what does she say? He's been dead for four days. The smell will be terrible. That tells us what she really believed, right? Lazarus is dead and he's, he's not going to be alive. It's going to be awful. It's going to be awful. And Jesus says, didn't I tell you, you would see God's glory. Roll the stone. Lazarus, come forth. Lazarus, come forth. Jesus deals. Yes, we should have good doctrine, but Jesus deals with our hearts and our response because that is where we live. That is where we live. So he makes it, he makes it real and he makes it personal. 
Now, I said that he took, Jesus took them up to Caesarea Philippi. He asks the two questions, and then we find something interesting. Who answers the question, the second question? The first question, who do people say that I am? The disciples answered in general. This one, that one, another one, or whatever. Who answers the second question? But who do you say that I am? <laughs> Our good friend Peter, who always has, who's always ready to jump in and say something. Peter answers, and we read the verses, didn't we? We know what it says. Uh, go back to go back to slide one again, just a minute. Okay, yeah, no, you're right, you're right, Andres. Go back to what it was. Okay, who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, "You're the Messiah, the Son of the Living God." He says, "You are blessed because my Father in heaven has revealed this to you." I want you to see something, and this helps me so much. This helps me so much because it doesn't depend on Simon Peter so much. Simon Peter, honestly, folks, he was a mess a lot of times, wasn't he? He was frail. He was weak at times. He was strong at other times in another place. Uh, remember, Jesus asks a question, and remember what Peter says uh, when Jesus asks his disciples. He says, he says, he teaches a really hard teaching about discipleship, and then he asks the disciples, are you going to leave me too? Because a lot of people stopped following Jesus. Remember what Peter said? He says, oh, to whom, to whom else will we go? You have the words that give life. I love that, don't you? You have the words. That's in John chapter 6. You have the thing, maybe John 6, 44. I don't remember exactly. He says, you have the words. Yeah, uh, John 6, 68 is where it is. You have the words that give eternal life. It encourages me that our frail brother Peter, our weak brother Peter, who was such an imperfect Christian, could receive revelation from God. That gives hope for us, doesn't it? We don't have to be super spiritual. We don't have to have it all together. We don't have to know all the answers. We don't have to be perfect. But we have to have a heart for God. We have to have a desire for God. We have to have a hunger for God. And I believe Peter had all of those things. And he, he it received this revelation from God. And as we, as we look at this and as we think about this, I want you to think about this. Simon says, you didn't learn this from any human being. My Father in heaven has revealed this to you. And I want to talk just a little bit about this revelation of the Lord. And I want us to, to think about the backdrop. Where did this take place? Was it in Jerusalem? No. Was it at a temple or a synagogue somewhere? No. They were perhaps on a mountainside somewhere. They were in Caesarea Philippi. We talked about this a little bit last time. In the second service, not so much. But Caesarea Philippi was a pagan, pagan city. It was at the very northern part of Palestine. It was the topmost, it was the furthest from the temple in Jerusalem that you could get and still be in Palestinian territory and still be still be part of the of the nation it was that high up there were no there was not a temple there i don't know that there was a synagogue pro pro probably there was a synagogue there but they weren't in the synagogue the background of this city was very very pagan in the early years it had been a, a center of worship to baal after that when the greeks ruled it had been a place where the Greek god Pan was worshipped in the grottos and the caves in the area. And at the present, it had a huge temple to Caesar Augustus that had been built by Herod to honor him. This was the surrounding. This, these were the circumstances. What a place for revelation from God. Don't you have to be in a whoo, special place? to receive revelation from God? Doesn't the atmosphere have to be very holy to receive revelation from God? Doesn't it have to be oh, just right, lights dim and, and really nice Christian music playing to receive revelation from God? We act that way sometimes, don't we? We really do. Like we'll work up to it and sometime we'll, some, somehow we'll have revelation. I love this picture, brothers and sisters, because what we see is this. When we're with Jesus, and we're in fellowship with him. 
He can bring revelation to our heart, to our circumstances, to our lives, however difficult it is. Whatever is going on, whatever the circumstances, whatever the backdrop, it has to do with Jesus. It doesn't have to do with the circumstances. I was thinking about this in relation to the Apostle John in the last book, the, uh, the Revelation of Jesus Christ is actually the name of, um, of the last book, the book of Revelation. Do you remember where John, John, not John the Baptist, but John the Beloved, do you remember where he was when he received the Revelation and wrote the book of Revelation, the last book of the Bible? Where was he? He was on the island of Patmos, which is still there today. The island of Patmos was a prison island. It was, there were no other buildings there. There were no stores. There was no normal community there. It was a prison island. It's an island that is a rocky island. No trees on the island. No trees whatsoever. Even today, no trees on the island. About six feet, uh, six, that'd be really small, six miles, okay? Uh, so that'd be about nine or so kilometers. Six miles wide, ten miles long, and only prisoners of Rome and the guards were there. And that's where John was. The prisoners were requ required to work hard labor in the mines, and John was an old man at this point. If you go back and you look at the beginning of Revelation, do you know what you will read? John says, I was in the island of Patmos, and remember what it says? Beautiful words. He said, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. Brothers and sisters, the revelation of God can come to you wherever you are when you are in the Spirit. When you are in the Spirit. When you're in fellowship with God. It does not matter how bleak the circumstances. It does not matter how dark the night. If you are a prisoner in a prison cell, as John was, a prisoner on the island of Patmos, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and the revelation was given to him at that time. The revelation of God comes when we need it, when our hearts are open to him, when our hearts are hungry for him. It does not come through our intellect, it does not come through all of our IQ and all of our brain power. Although I will tell you this, the spiritually lazy Christian will seldom receive the revelation of the Lord. That's true. The spiritually, if we don't spend time in the Word of God or if we just, oh, I forgot, it's time for my devotions. Just before you go to sleep when you really are almost asleep or when you get up in the morning, oh, okay, I'll do it later and whatever. That, that's... There's, there will be little revelation for the spiritually lazy and the spiritually undisciplined person of God, child of God. And I don't say that to, to judge or condemn. I say that to encourage you. That God wants to, God, there's revelation for you. There's revelation for me. But it comes from Him as we spend time with Him and our hearts are open to Him. John was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. And the revelation came. And the revelation came. Bleak and difficult surroundings do not limit God. You know, uh, you all know that in my background, I went to China in the mid-80s. It was tough in China in those days. It was really, really tough. We knew for sure that our bedrooms, that our rooms, that there were listening devices, there were bugs in the rooms. We knew that. That was very, very clear. I remember one time going on a trip and a man, that sounded, it was like a television spy thing, a man with a shoulder bag. It was a camera and he was following, he was following us around, taking, like this, taking pictures of the people that we met or whatever. There was so little privacy in, in China in those days. And I still remember uh, this, this uh, woman who's teaching there before I, she had come about two years before I had in the earlier years when it was even more difficult. And she described when and how she used to pray. And you know what she would do? Because you can be in the spirit anywhere. She said, oh, she said, I just get on my bicycle with all the millions of people. And she said, I would just get on my bicycle and I would just ride through the streets. And she said, I'd just be praying to the Lord. And, and she would pray in English because very few people could understand English. And she would just pray in the Spirit. And, and the Lord knew that, and that's the only one who needed to understand what she was praying. But she would just ride the streets and just pray, 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 pray in, in dark communist China in those days. 
circumstances do not limit circumstances do not limit your your time with God and the revelation of God to you and that's one of the things that we that we see here now Jesus says to Simon Peter he says this wasn't revealed to you by flesh and blood you didn't learn it from a human being my father in heaven and that's why I love when we look at this when Jesus was talking about John the Baptist uh, when Jesus was talking about the Holy Spirit look at look at this with me for just a minute this is the night that he's betrayed and I'm still talking about revelation and understanding and receiving things when he the spirit of truth comes he will guide you into all truth he will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears. He will tell you what is yet to come. He will bring glory to me by taking from what is mine and making it known to you. All that belongs to the Father is mine. That's why I said the Spirit will take from what is mine and make it known to you. Brothers and sisters, if you have questions about the Trinity or if people say, oh, the Bible doesn't tr teach about the Trinity of God, here's, here's a great passage for you. It's Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But I love this. This is an imperfect example, but let me use it instead. Uh, let me, let me, let me. Gene, you're in the first service. Come on up here. Just, just by way of example, I, I messed them up in the first service because I was wandering around the church and they were trying to follow me. So don't come too close. There's Jean. Here's Jean. She's a child of God. And let's say that she's going through something in her life and she's praying and she's seeking God and there is a need in her life. It may be, it may be for forgiveness for someone. Forgiveness, have you forgiveness is hard, isn't it? Forgiveness, it's not an easy thing, especially when it cuts deep and especially when it's somebody in your family or a loved one. And, and here's Jean and she's praying. Or she's going through a storm in her life and there's no peace. But he's the Prince of Peace. But oh, there's no peace in her life. Or she wants to forgive and it's so, so hard. Or it's another situation. God, I don't know what to do. And she's praying and she's praying and she's praying. What is the role of the Holy Spirit in this situation? Well, we know that Jesus has everything that we need, don't we? Jesus has everything that ne he, we need. He is everything that we need. And Jesus says, the Holy Spirit, oh, here's Jean. Oh, I need peace. I'm in a storm. Oh, God, where are you? And the Holy Spirit takes of Jesus. My child needs peace. And the Holy Spirit ministers, reveals, applies the peace of Jesus to Jean's heart, to Jean's life, to Jean's situation. Or maybe she wants to forgive and she just can't. Have you ever wanted to forgive and you just couldn't? I have. It's hard. It's hard. I want to, but God, I just, I can't. It's so hard. I'm so angry at them. Or I may even feel hatred towards them because of what they've done. But God, I know your word says, and I just can't, but I want to. Oh, please, change my heart. Change me. I can't change myself. And the Holy Spirit, because it's his job. It's what he is equipped to do. It's what he is empowered to do. Comes and brings into her life or reveals in her life the forgiveness because Jesus who bore all things Jesus who endured all things could say on his behalf and on your behalf and my behalf Father forgive them Father forgive them now I can't forgive but Jesus can and I know it up here, but I've got to have it down here. That's the job of the Holy Spirit. That's why we've got to give Him space in our lives, brothers and sisters. And the Holy Spirit comes, and He applies, and He reveals, and He does what we cannot do. That's revelation. That's revelation. That's the work. That's the job of the Holy Spirit. <coughs> That's why Jesus said to Peter, blessed are you, Peter. God revealed that to you. That's why you and I have to have the revelation of Jesus in our lives through the work of the Holy Spirit. Through the work of the Holy Spirit, we must have him. We're in difficult circumstances. We're in difficult settings. 
and we've got to have him come. We may have come to the place, some of us, uh, let, me, let me share this. This was as I was praying for us last night. You see, I, I've, got a, I've got a huge library in my home. Huge library and an even larger online library. I study, I prepare, I've got my notes and I've told you before, I don't, I don't go find a sermon book somewhere. I prepare and I, and I study and, and, and get things ready. But you know what? All of my studying does you no good. It does you no good. It can help your brain, but that's all it will do. You've got to have revelation from God. You've got to have living food from God. And I can only give living food and living revelation and living bread if I get it from God. And so after all the hours of, of study, after, after all the hours on the computer, then I have to get on my knees and say, oh God, your people need revelation. Your people need living bread so that there's something living to give to you. To whom else shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. But you have to do it as well. You have to receive from the Lord. You see, I believe here in Lighthouse, and it's time to come to a close this morning, that we probably say we're a good church, and I think we are. I think we are. We seek God. We try to teach what is true. We try to understand the word correctly. And we can look at a lot of other churches and say, they're dead. Uh, or we can say, there's a lot of activity, but there's not a lot of spirit. And maybe we say, maybe we think these things at times. But brothers and sisters, my concern, uh, if you'll turn it off, please. My concern, that's okay, just keep your focus this way. That's all right. My concern is that in Lighthouse, you and I can come in these doors and walk out these doors week after week after week. And we can get so busy. Just take it outside if you can't turn it out, can't turn it off. Thank you. Quickly take it outside. I'm going to pause just a minute. May I say something? I'm not, this is what the devil does at an important time. I, I'm not pointing a finger, but I'm just saying, that's so why we got to be careful with these things. But I, I m my burden is we can come to Lighthouse and we can go out week after week after week, but if we have not touched God, then our lives are just full of religious busy work and busy activity, just, just like the people we read about in the Word of God, just like plenty of other churches that we might say we're not like they are, but people are the same. Brothers and sisters, we've got to touch God. We've got to receive revelation from the Lord. We've got to hear from Him. And it's not enough. It's good that pastors, your pastors, seek God for revelation, but that's not enough as well because it's got to be received in hearts that are open to receive Him as well. Jesus has come that we might have life. Jesus has come to minister to us. The Holy Spirit has come to do His work in your heart and in your life. And I encourage you this morning, if you have gotten stale, if you are kind of feeling, I come to church and I leave, I come to church, yeah, it's great, but there is not a revelation of Jesus in your life and a transforming work of Jesus in your life, then there can be. And there should be. And there should be. Come to Him. Open your heart to Him. Doesn't matter what your circumstances are. It matters what your heart is in response to Him. And it will take the revelation of God through the working of the Holy Spirit. And that's what we must have. That's what I must have for myself and for you as well. And it's what you must have apart from what happens on Sunday morning. Because Sunday morning it's not enough. It's not enough. It won't get you through the week. Uh, barely to the next Sunday morning. It's not enough. Bread is fresh every day. Every day. Lord, we come to you this morning. We come to you this morning. Oh, living bread that has come down from heaven, we need you. Living water that springs up 
an artesian well overflowing into eternal life. We need you. Jesus, we need you. You have come to give us life. In your Holy Spirit, O oh Holy Spirit, you have come to take what is of Jesus and apply it to our lives, reveal it to our lives, so that we can have not only good doctrine, but that our hearts and our lives will be changed, and that all that Jesus is, Lord, that you apply it to our lives, and our lives are changed. And we see you differently, and we see our situations differently. Though we may be on the island of Patmos, we are in the Spirit. We are in the Spirit. Oh, Jesus, we need you this day. May we never grow stale. May we never, oh God, may we never fill our lives with religious activity instead of spiritual life. We come to you. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. 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 God bless you. We're praying for you. Let God be real to your life this week. Each day, come to Him. Happy Mother's Day.